Hello, welcome back to another Prismatica devlog. Today we're going to be talking about my character system that I've spent about a month kind of chipping away at. And we're going to be talking about all of the requirements that I had for this system, uh, as well as, you know, how I achieved the results and, you know, why I did what I did and that kind of stuff. So the four requirements that I had when I set out to, you know, start creating characters for the game was that they needed to be as performant as possible. So that meant minimizing draw calls, and we've currently got it down to two draw calls per character, one for the entire mesh and one for the entire material. It's all accounted for, it's all one draw call, it's all good. So the second requirement that I had was that we needed complete control over all of the colors of the armor. So, you know, I can switch the color of my chest plate here. Um, I'm gonna change it back because I like this color better. As well as all of the sort of attributes of the armor. So, you know, I can make my shoulder plates not shiny, you know, so they look like they're kind of painted or something. Make them shiny again. Make my chest plate look like it's, you know, made of velvet. Check it out. Check me out. I look beautiful. We could cover my entire body in dirt. Or we could make my arm armor, you know, rusted or something. So it basically allows a lot of deep customization um, per even like segment of the armor, all in one material, mind you. So while we're on the topic of materials, the third criteria that I had to fill uh, was that we wanted to use a unisex character. So, you know, one skeletal mesh base, one skeleton. We only wanted to do, you know, one model of, you know, the armor and that kind of stuff, and then use some sort of transforms, you know, so I can go from masculine, you now I can become feminine. I look kind of cute as a girl. <laughs> we can be feminine, but also have big muscle mass. So, you know, I just pumped up my, my muscle parameter, and, you know, now I can get really, really fat. I look beautiful. Do a little turnaround. It's all one model. There's just some, you know, secret uh, displacement method that we're using for all of our character things. It's all done on the GPU in the shader itself. There's no actual, um, you know, morph targets or anything like that. So I'll be covering that in the video. And then the fourth and final thing was that it needs to be integrated with my damage and gore system, um, as well as like my fake cloth sim stuff, which I've covered in another video. If you do want to check out the videos about the gore system and the fake wind system for the clothing and stuff, you can do so up in the top left corner. I'll put a little annotation. There is a lot of stuff to take into account with the damage system. It's all completely modular. Uh, it's super easy to use-ish. There's a few little quirks of it, but I'm very happy with how it's turned out. So I guess with that, we begin the video. Woohoo! Hey guys, so I just finished editing this video and it goes for like an hour. So I'm going to put some like timestamps in the, uh, in the doobly-doo down the bottom so that if you're only interested in like a few aspects of, you know, the whole character system, uh, you can just go to that bit and hopefully it kind of explains everything in isolation. I also just want to make a quick shout out to all of our patrons. Um, we've gotten more patrons over the past few weeks and I love to just shout you guys out as often as possible. Um, so I hope that you guys enjoy the video. <sighs> well, where on earth do I begin? So I guess the first thing worth doing is to have a little look at the material that we're using for these characters. Now, this material uh, is quite a, a big one, and it looks pretty complex. Uh, but then, we have this big function over here, uh, which is essentially a UV atlas for, you know, all of the colors, all of the sort of attributes and parameters for all of the bits of armor and that kind of thing. Now, this does look super expensive, and when you look at the instruction count, it's 472 instructions. Um, keep in mind, the majority of that is just simple math operations, you know, literally just vector, do some math. The 
benefit of doing everything all in one material is that it only uses one draw call. So if we take a look at this scene here, you can see that we've got, I think it's 800 characters all at once. Now this is the old character. If we go to the mesh, you can see that material element 0, 1, 2, and 3. So there's four separate materials on it. And I guess my first naive approach would have been to make each sort of item that the, you know, the player or any character can equip its own material slot. You know, you just swap the material out with the item. Now this would work, definitely. And if, you know, you're not planning on rendering, you know, heaps of characters at once, then absolutely super fine. You know, if it's a single sort of character game or there's like small groups of enemies, multiple material slots, super easy to work with. But if we wanted to render 800 characters at once, uh, you can see that my FPS is chugging a little bit. 14 FPS. Uh, this is with four draw calls per character. Well, five if you include the mesh itself. And also keep in mind that the materials themselves on these characters are very, very lightweight. A color and zero in the specular. <laughs> so what we're going to do now, we're going to swap the mesh over with one of my character meshes. And we're going to swap the material out with one of my super mega big big boys okay so we've now swapped the character out for a more complex character with a more complex material uh, although this character only uses one draw call even though the material itself is quite complex uh we're getting about 50 fps pretty much on the dot with 800 skeletal meshes um with a single draw call 50 fps pretty good now, even if draw calls, you know, didn't exist or something, or, you know, CPU could just spit everything to the GPU without any sort of hassle, there would be a lot of repeated code. So, for example, you know, if there were multiple material slots, then every material would need to be doing this rim light parameter, and every material would need to, you know, take into account blood on the surface of the character, blood on hard surfaces of the character, the rustiness of the metal parts of the character, you know, all of the damage code, um, all of the, you know, lerping colors for, like, the blood effects and stuff, all of the, you know, wetness color change, all of the clothing damage code, the, you know, the dirtiness of the characters and that kind of thing. All of that stuff would need to be run for every material that's on the character. So this way, even though the material's more complex, you know, all of this stuff, which would need to get done for each smaller material anyway, gets done all in one, one go. So that's sort of the reasoning behind a single unified material. It also just makes it a lot easier to set parameters, you know, on the material. It's just like, you know, hey, I need to change the color of the, the chest armor because we equipped a new item just set it on the material. That's it. We don't have to find which material it is in which order and that kind of thing. It's just like, bam, set the chest parameters, you're done. So I guess the first thing to talk about is what on earth is going on over here. Uh, basically, it's a big function that acts as a blend. Uh, this is like a an atlas bitmask blend using the UVs of the character. So I guess the best way to explain how it works and why it works is with this little cube here. Uh, we're gonna look at this material. Uh, it's an absolute fucking mess, hold on. So if we were to get this bit here, so you can see here, all we've done is we've taken the texture coordinates and we've quantized it into squares uh, using a very simple function. We multiply it by a number, so one becomes, you know, nine in this case. Then we floor it so that any of the in-between parts from, you know, zero to one or one to two or two to three get rounded down to the nearest integer. Uh, and then we divide it at the end by the number minus one. And so what that does is that it just splits it up into even segments. So if we have a look here, uh, this is that little bit of code that we 
just looked at before, the one that quantizes it into squares. This bit here says how big is each segment, like what's the value of each segment. Uh, this bit here is saying which one do we want to select. So if I move this along, you know, you can see it's selecting a different row. And then we subtract whichever one from the overall values. So the atlas itself looks like this. Then after we subtract whichever one we want, it will look like this. So you can see it's kind of just making it all black. But if we have the middle one selected, so this one is zero, the ones either side are actually negative, you know, 0.25 or something, and this is negative 0.5. So what we can do after that is use an absolute node, bam. Now we have black in the middle and some value over zero either side. Uh, so then what we do is we can either use seal or alternatively we could use sign. Uh, basically, sign just says, uh, let me read it, returns negative one if the input is less than zero, one if greater, or zero if equal. Now, that's the important part. According to my lead developer, he is certain that sign is very slightly cheaper than seal. So I'll take his word for it. <laughs> but you can see now that we have absolute zero here and absolute one here. Um, then obviously we're going to one minus this because we want to be selecting the middle one. And ta-da, we have this row selected. So if you have watched five minute materials and you know about, you know, multiply and that kind of thing, if we were to multiply one of the horizontal rows by one of the vertical columns, then we're going to get a little square. It's basically like an and function. It's, you know, is it this and this, you know, we can move these both around if we wanted and blah, blah, blah. If we had a color value, let's just get red or something, and we multiplied it by this mask that we created, then essentially this is gonna show up red or pink wherever this mask is. So if we were to scrappily just get a bunch of these functions um, and, you know, mask them to different colors and that kind of thing, and then add them all together. So obviously if you add zeros together, it's zero. But if you add anything over zero together, it's, you know, it's gonna add them together. Um, so if we just have a look at what this would look like, then you can see that we can start to create an atlas of arbitrary values. Now keep in mind, this doesn't just apply to colors. This can be any parameter that we want. It could be, you know, the alpha, it could be the shininess value, it could be the you know, what material is this character's piece of armor made of thing. And so in essence, what we end up creating is an atlas that could look something like this. Obviously, don't mind the uh, the texture behind it, just the colors here. We can isolate any colors, any value on any point of a UV map. And so if we actually look inside the function, uh, you can see that this is exactly what it's doing. It's doing the quantization here, then it is getting each segment of it, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to nine. And then it isolates that and then it multiplies it by each row, which I've just done it again in here. It's just doing the same thing except with the, the Y or the V direction of the, of the UV map. And so that way it's pretty neat in order to just sort of, you know, multiply each sort of permutation, each segment of the, uh, the UV map. Now, keep in mind that all of this repeated code that you see, the, the compiler is very, very smart in how it, you know, optimizes stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, even though this looks quite expensive, it is relatively cheap. Um, and that also goes for having multiple of these functions in the same graph all of the internals of it sort of get optimized into, you know, one sort of batch. Um, the only scaling consideration is how many parameters we end up adding. So for every parameter that we add, it adds one instruction to the instruction count because these are variables, you know, they can change at any point. So it can't actually optimize any of these together. So what this allows me to do is to change the color to any color, uh, any, you know, sort of 
shininess, glossiness value, any sort of, you know, rustiness value and that kind of thing. All of those parameters go through that function um, and then gets assigned to the UV space that corresponds with, you know, how I've set the character up. So you can see here in Blender, come here, caddy. Hello. How you doing, Smoochie? What's up? You want to join in? All right, let me keep explaining. So in Blender, I have this little helper atlas texture thing, which basically reminds me where each component of the armor or the character is supposed to go. Now, this isn't like set in stone. I can, you know, put anything anywhere. This is just to prevent overlap. So if we have a look at this character here. Uh, you can see if I select it in UV edit mode, that all of the pieces of armor uh, are assigned to their own little space. Now, these don't have to be scaled to, you know, anything. It's completely arbitrary. This is just to basically print the values that we're setting in the material onto these parts of the mesh. So if we look here, we can select the chest armor and it's all assigned to the chest armor slot. You know, the shirt underneath it is assigned to the shirt slot. The hood and stuff is assigned to the hood slash neck slot. So everything is in its right place. Now, if I was to, you know, let's say, put on some different armor or something, let's get this brigandine going. And we were to, you know, just check out the UVs again. You can see nothing's overlapping still because, you know, we had this spot reserved for chest armor. So that's how all this kind of parameter stuff works. Um, is just using, you know, a UV slot on the, uh, on the character. I think the main thing to keep in mind about this material is that it isn't actually atlasing the results of, you know, all of these effects and stuff. It's atlasing the values that go into the lerps of these effects. So, for example, the rustiness function just looks like this. It's these few little lines of code here, but into the alpha, is, you know, the atlas or parts of the atlas that, you know, we've specified. So that way, the rustiness effect only gets done once using the atlas. And the atlas might look like, you know, this. It might only have a couple of things plugged in, different values. And then this gets, you know, UV'd onto the character. Super efficient in terms of all the extra effects and stuff. So the other question is, how do we get these textures onto the character. If we have a look here, you can see that there is basically another atlas going on, this time with normal maps. So this is essentially the exact same as that other one, but this one is a three by three grid. Uh, and then essentially all we do is we get, you know, these bunch of textures which are swapped out with each item. So, you know, this is for the helmet or the hat, this is for the chest plate that the, uh, you know, the player can equip. This is for the arms. This is for the hands. Legs, feet. There's two spare ones, which we're not using yet, but, you know, the option's there. And we make sure that they're scaled down exactly three times. So these repeat three times each, you can see kind of here. And that way, when they're, you know, masked on this atlas, it's like a full, full resolution texture just in the corner of the UV space. Then obviously anytime we have an item, you know, let's say the shoulder and arm armor, which is one item that a character can have equipped, all of their UVs that correspond to the textures go in a separate UV channel. So UV channel two, and we then move them up into that corner of its UV space. So it's kind of like a, um, a UDIM, but it's all within one UV space, but it is, it's, it's basically like a pre-made atlas. So even if we were to, you know, create a new skelly mesh with different armor and stuff, that UV space in the corner or wherever it's, you know, assigned would be vacant and ready to receive the new one. So each item in the game, so each, you know, piece of armor or clothing or equipment or whatever is made up of smaller elements. So, for example, if we just hide this hood real quick. For our arm armor, uh, we could say that, you know, this and this and this and this. All of these things here, even like the overlapping, you know, sort of parts, 
uh, if they're all intended to be used together, will get baked into a single texture. So for example, here's an atlas of something. Um, you know how atlases look. And so this set of arm armor would have its own unique texture, which as I explained before, you know, would be in its assigned little quadrant or nundrant, uh, if it's a nine segmented. And so all of these elements get exported as individual scally meshes and then combined in game as necessary. So you might find a piece of armor that, you know, looks like this. It's like, you know, the classic asymmetrical badass, you know, pauldron on one side, spalder on the other. You know, you got your, you got your cooters here. You know, this could be one item. Then there could be a variant, you know, that looks like this, you know, this is like arm armor without the, the big shoulder bits. So this and the previous item would share the same texture. And so that saves a lot of juice. You know, it would be very impractical to bake a different texture for, you know, this configuration here and, you know, this one here, and then one that didn't have these on them and just, you know, every possible iteration of this set of arm armor. It would be <laughs> quite ridiculous. So this way we get a ton of variation from the assets and all of that variation is done inside the engine. So if we have a look at this texture here that is assigned to this, you know, this particular breastplate, um, this is the texture that creates the element. So this texture will then get baked, like transferred to, you know, the Atlas UV arrangement texture thing that I've talked about before. You can see that we're not actually using colors in here. We're actually using just different R, G, and B values for different things. So if I just isolate the red channel, you can see that this is a height map. You know, I'm actually using this height map to generate normals inside Blender. If we then look at the blue channel, you can see that this determines where each of the sub colors goes. 0 0.5 gray is color number one, black is color number two, and white is color number three. And so in the engine, this is used for all of the details and stuff. So if I go to the, you know, the chest armor parameters, you know, we can change color one, which is, you know, the 0 0.5 blue color. Um, color two is the trimming. So, you know, we can have gold trimming or we could have like, you know, black trimming or, you know, white or something like that. And then number three is for the rivets in the armor. So, you know, tons of customization there. Uh, a lot of variation that's possible and, you know, it can really help make some of the details pop and keep them, you know, within a cool color scheme and that kind of thing. And these alternate colors also come into play in other parts of this, you know, of the character system, particularly the damage system, which I'll talk about very shortly. Uh, and then the green channel gets used for the, the alpha, um, just to, you know, cut holes in stuff without having to actually make the geometry more dense. So you can see that here, there's like a little bit of green along here. These are just punched out using the green channel. So the final texture for each set ends up looking like this, where the R and G channels are the normal map for the, for the set. Then the blue channel is the color map. And then the green channel will then get packed into the alpha channel which is for this one in particular is just, you know, one everywhere. And so that texture is then what gets used in this, you know, sort of uh, modular atlas thing in the material. So one of the last things to talk about within the material is this little row here, which doesn't actually contain colors, but rather contains parameters for, you know, the sections of the armor and stuff. These all get fed into, you know, our Atlaser. But then after that, we then have a function called the Character Material Type Mask. Uh, you can see again, it's very similar. So what we're doing here is we're taking the alpha of the Atlas that we've made, that we've combined. We're then doing a very similar function that will separate, you know, black and white masks based on the value of the alpha. So, for example, if our skin is made of flesh, then the alpha should be set to zero. 
If our helmet is made of metal, then the alpha should be set to 0.5. If our shirt is made of fabric, then its alpha should be set to 0.25. And these, these numbers are completely arbitrary. They're only numbers because you can't really use an enumeration in a material. So that's just something that, you know, I make note of here. I need to update that because we've got more types now. <laughs> so essentially what this function is asking is what kind of, you know, sub material type are you? And it splits it off into black and white masks using this function. And we get these outputs here, flesh, fabric, metal, metal covered, and chain. And, you know, we might, we can add more of these as time goes on if needed. Um, probably won't need anything other than them. <laughs> uh, then the other thing that we do is we actually get the R, G, and B values from the Atlas. We multiply them by the finished black and white masks. And then we append the resulting RGB values into the alpha. So the alpha now is a black and white mask that says, this is flesh, this is metal, this is blah, 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 blah. But now the RG and B values are saying, this is RG and B for this particular material type. So what that kind of does, I'll give you an example here. So if we go to our chest armor, and we go to the parameters value here. The value set at 0.5, which means this is a metal. So the R value in this parameter vector is gonna do something different compared to a fabric. So if it's a metal using, you know, alpha 0.5, then this will make the armor rusty. But if I change this to 0.25, now the red value affects how affected by the wind, you know, the fake wind shader it is. So we're basically kind of contextualizing the qualities of the armor based on the alpha value. So if we have a quick little look at this armor here, chest armor parameters slot, and we put the green up, then you can see that this looks like it's made of velvet or something. Nice and shiny, bit of a Fresnel effect. So yeah, basically we can assign different parameters, different attributes to different material types in the, in the character. So I forgot to mention that the reason this is important is because we don't need metal armor to have a wind affectation value and we don't need flesh to be able to use the velvet shader and we don't need the fabric, you know, to be able to be rusty or something. Um, so this just saves us having, you know, a billion different parameters for every slot when it isn't actually needed and it also saves instructions. Why do I forget to turn my stream notifications off? <laughs> and so it saves a bunch of instructions because we can just use this one vector and get, you know, like 12 different parameter effects out of these four values. The other thing that this is really useful for, uh, like having, you know, separate material types or, or being able to define different submaterial types is for the damage system for the characters. So you can see if I hit this guy, a few times it's dinting the metal plate armor but if i hit him here then you can see that i've actually poked a hole in the in the chain mail uh it's kind of hard to see because of the blood but just trust me it's there <laughs> uh likewise if i start to you know punch this guy up a bit just you know draw some damage to him so you can see on this guy you know for cloth fabric stuff um it gets all torn up you know there's holes in it uh, you can see some here. You can also see that the blood actually blurs into the cloth stuff, whereas on the metal, it's like, it's hard. This is chainmail that has fake fabric underneath it. If I just turn this fella around real quick. So we have this kind of fake fabric underneath the chainmail um, that's just, you know, using our, our color mask stuff. But because I've defined this as a chainmail, you know, thing, um, you know, it's factored in that, you know, there would be fabric underneath this. And so you can see that there's fabric. And if there's any point where we've just broken, you know, a bit of the chain mail, then there's still fabric underneath it. And it will take a few more hits to kind of reveal the, uh, the fabric underneath. And then lastly, but not leastly, for things like covered metals, like, you know, brigandines or, you know, leather covered metal armor, uh, we do very much a similar thing where we factor in this kind of little fabric stitching 
uh, alpha thing into a transition between color number one, which is the red, you know, velvety looking thing, and color number two, which is what the rivets are made of. And so, yeah, basically it looks like this is getting damaged wherever they get hit, which is the important thing. And so if I went into these material parameters and I went to our global damage addition thingo, um, you can see that, you know, as I put this up, everything just gets pretty, you know, pretty fucked. But it gets pretty fucked in different and unique ways. You know, you can see the chainmail gets broken, the armor and stuff gets dinted and, you know, roughened up. You know, the brigandine will tear the fabric away. Cloth armor will just, you know, deteriorate like this. You know, it'll become all raggedy and it'll get more affected by the wind and it will actually droop down a bit. So it kind of tatters off them. Uh, it tatters in world space as well. So if I got this guy and we, you know, flipped him on his side, then you can see these pants actually tatter downwards as well, which is a nice little, nice little effect. And obviously this sort of damage thing can be used to, you know, if we spawn in a character, but we want to make them look worse for wear off the bat, um, we can just turn up their global damage thing. And that just adds in to the damage calculation. You know, it just feeds into the alpha. So this guy looks, you know, a bit worse for wear. Uh, we can also do this per item slot, uh, which I don't have set up at the moment, but you can imagine the same texture atlas that gets used for the normal maps and the, you know, the colored mask textures, we can actually select objects using that. So for example, if I had this set up correctly, um, we could apply damage to just one item of the character. So this would be the pants or something. Um, we can also say, you know, this one is highlighted for whatever reason. Um, and also, you know, this one is extra bloody. So that way we can basically control the, you know, the quality of an item visually. So instead of having to say, you know, this is a, a poor quality set of pants, uh, we can actually just show that on the character. You know, you, you find some pants, they're just called pants. You put them on, they got fucking holes all in them. So you know that they're shit. Whereas, you know, you find some armor that is like, you know, pristine, smooth, polished looking, and you're like, hell yeah, this, this must be good. Likewise, if you face an opponent that is wearing, you know, plate armor, but the armor's all rusty and it's all bumpy and it looks like it's, you know, made by a child, then, you know, you know that that's not very good armor. And so it really does help to feed into the, the premise of, you know, what you see is what you get. You should be able to tell you know, what your opponent is wearing and what their, I guess, stats are just by looking at them. So that's about it for the setup of the material and sort of the, the layout of how the characters are constructed. I think I'm going to take a little break real quick, but coming right up, we will talk about how the character transforms happen. So, you know, we've got our feminine, we've got our masculine, we've got our muscle mass, we got our thickness parameter. So I will see you in one tick. Hello. Welcome back. So where were we? I just realized that entire previous segment was done with my hair up in a towel. So I'm gonna wear another hat for this section. So as promised, we are going to have a little look at how we do the sort of character morphs um, or the body transforms. So if we have a look at this character right here and we just go into their material, you can see that I have just this tiny little bit of shader stuff going on here. Uh, and this can just straight up control the, you know, the overall look of the character. Um, so we can, you know, be feminine with extra muscle and then make them fat and you know that kind of thing and as you can see the actual color of this character is just their vertex color plugged in to the base color so we are using vert color for all of the displacements and stuff and the kind of reasoning for that is that vertex color is stored on the character anyway you know as just like one 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 everywhere by default obviously 
And so by doing this, we're kind of not actually adding any extra data. We're just altering existing data. And the other benefit is that this is all super cheap. Without this, it is about 12 instructions less in the vertex shader. So this is like, I, I, would, I would basically go ahead and say that this is free to do. Obviously it isn't free and it scales with the vertex density of the characters, uh, but our characters are quite, quite sparse anyway. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, and obviously this works with LODs and it works with generated LODs as well, because you know, if we were to decimate this vertex here, um, it would inherit, you know, the, the midpoint between all the other verts around it. So this is a really simple process. Now it does have a couple of downsides. Um, now one of them is actually kind of a blessing in disguise. And that is that we can only actually alter the vertexes or the vertices in the direction of the vertex normal. So we can only inflate or deflate the mesh. Um, so, you know, it would end up looking like this. Uh, this red one is the, the after. Uh, whereas with shape keys or morph targets or, you know, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, we could make this shape end up looking something like, you know, this if we wanted to. Uh, and because, you know, it just has the, the positions here and then where their positions are supposed to go with, you know, whatever offset for each vert and blah, 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 blah. Now, the downside with this is that if we had multiple morph targets that were overlaid on top of each other, uh, when we kind of get the midpoint of each of these, it might end up looking something like none of them, you know? So midpoint here, this one would be here. So... This blue one here looks nothing really like either of the, the black ones. So by kind of limiting ourselves to only inflating or deflating the mesh, when we, you know, we add the, let's say this is the fatness one, and then we want to add the, you know, masculine feminine one. Maybe it's doing something like this, where like that doesn't do anything and that goes like that. All that's happening is that these values are just getting added together. It literally just adds them all up and that's the final position of the thing. So that kind of made a bit of sense, um, but we will go into Blender and actually look at how we author this. All right, Shift H, there we go. So this is our low poly base character. Um, this is without the normal map applied to it. And if we go into the shading tab, we're gonna to go to the geometry node editor. Uh, this is a, another shader graph. This is the blender shader graph for geometry nodes. What we're doing is we're just getting the weights from a vertex group. So it's like, you know, weight painting, except this is like a weight that takes up the entire character. It's not actually bound to any bone either. Um, we remap that so that we can do it inwards and outwards and so that 0.5 is the middle point. And then with that remapped, you know, value range, we displace the position of a vertex by the normal, resulting in another position. So if I go ahead and plug this one in, you can see that immediately we're violating YouTube's terms of service. If we plug this one in, we get, you know, big muscle mass. Now, the way that we actually paint these, if I go into weight paint mode, uh, we're gonna make sure everything's locked and we're gonna go to the, the muscle channel, which is the green one. So now in real time, I'm able to, you know, alter the inflation and deflation of this character. Um, you know, I can add bits to him and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, he looks stunning. So we start with the, the base character for these morphs and we make it look, you know, how it should. So let's just select the body of this character and we're going to shift D to duplicate the faces and stuff. I'm just gonna move it up a tiny bit to avoid merging. Then we're just gonna sort of inflate it around the character. We're going to right click this and we're going to click separate selection. So now this is a separate object. We're gonna go back into it we're going to make sure we're in x-ray mode and we're going to just select, you know, down here. We're just going to get this. We're just going to delete these faces. 
So let's just say this is, you know, a shirt. Now, if this wasn't extruded straight from the character, so if it didn't have any weights assigned to it, so now this doesn't have any groups at all, but the nice thing about this method is that we can just do a data transfer. So we go modifier, data transfer, and then we use the base mesh as the, the source. Uh, we go to vertex data, vertex groups, the mapping. I always find that nearest face interpolated works the best. And we're gonna hit generate data layers. Now this is gonna create all the vertex groups on the new, you know, empty thingo. Um, and then we can just hit apply, I believe. And if we now go to our weight paint, you can see we have all of our weights back and they've just been projected outwards from the body. So if we went into the geometry nodes editor and, you know, we got our feminine body morph, you can see that, you know, it just, it fits. Now, if there were any, you know, points that were clipping and stuff, we could just go in and, you know, alter them and, you know, pull some things out and push some things in and smooth some things out until, you know, it isn't clipping anymore, which, you know, can become a little bit tedious at times, but it is better than, you know, having to model a separate model for the masculine and the feminine characters. But it is super easy to, you know, transfer the data from the body to the clothing. So that's how, you know, with this entire character, um, we are able to, you know, change the shape of it, the shape of everything, um, all, you know, in sync with, with each other. The other nice thing about this is that it deforms really nicely. So if we went into pose mode and we start, you know, messing around with our character and moving them around and animating them and blah, blah, blah. Because we're only displacing along the vertex normal, everything just, it looks great when it is animated. You know, there's no issues whatsoever. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very controllable. It's very predictable in the way that, you know, it deforms stuff. So even if I set up a more, you know, extreme pose, if we were to change this to, you know, our, our large character, then you can see that there isn't really any clipping anywhere, actually. Yeah, that looks kind of good. <laughs> now, there is one little, I guess, issue that we run into with uh, this system, and that is with protruding armor pieces. So if I go to our arm armor stuff, we just get our pauldrons. Bam. You can see that these bits here that kind of jut up and out of the, you know, of the shoulders, um, they can't displace in the direction that the rest of it sort of goes. You know, everything can only deform in the direction uh, that it's facing. Now, in Unreal, when you do a displacement in the vertex normal, it will actually use the custom normal. So if I, for example, had this, you know, little jutting out part of the pauldron and I assigned its normals to face this way, uh, you know, straight up from our perspective, when we then displace it in the engine, it would move up this way. But as far as I know, there isn't any way in Blender to accurately kind of uh, see that, you know, as we're painting it. So that's something that I'll figure out down the line. If I can get that working in Blender, that would be, you know, problem solved. But yeah, it all works pretty well. And I'm pretty stoked with how it's, how it's working out. And so this just saves, you know, a ton of time down the line, you know, authoring specific morph targets and that kind of thing for every piece of armor it's basically just you know transfer it from the body most of the time it lines up if it doesn't line up do a little bit of fixing uh, and then we just call it call it done so the final step of this process is to actually bake it into the vertex color so for this example i'm just going to delete the vertex color here uh we're going to go vertex paint mode select all paint just set it as gray. Now it's a pretty quick process to do manually, but I will look into automating it completely just with like some sort of um, macro or whatever. 
So what we do is we have a second vertex color channel called the baker. Then we select the weight group that we want to paint the vertex color. So I've selected my red displacement. We hit paint vertex color from weight. So our red vertex color is now this. You can see that it's a uh, it's darker down here. It's brighter up here. Uh, then what we do is using a plugin called Vertex Color Master, which I highly recommend. It's free, uh, and it really just makes vertex painting stuff super easy. We can then copy the red channel or any channel of the baker because it's a it's a grayscale to the destination color 001 to the red channel. So we just hit copy. That'll do that. We go to the green channel, paint, vertex color from white. We then bake that to the green channel. We go to the blue channel. We go paint, vertex color from white. Switch that to the blue channel. We hit copy. And now if we look at our actual uh, vertex color channel, it's all there, ready to go. And once it's in the engine, it will deform 99% exactly how it was in Blender. Now, obviously there is a few more little steps that have to be done here. If the character is really large, then we'll need to do some like additive animation to make their hands, you know, come out here a little bit more. Um, same thing with if they are more muscular, we need to sort of offset their shoulder bones uh, to the side a tiny bit, which is super easy to do. So for the feminine characters, we leave the chest unaltered and then in the skeleton tree, we have extra bones in the chest um, to, you know, add some, some shape. There are also a few other helper bones. For example, uh, if I just grab this hood and just, I can get rid of you, just bloop. We have these ones for like the ears and stuff. So, you know, we can make the ears, you know, more elven or like goblin-esque or, you know, change the shape of them and do some wacky stuff with the ears. So bone transform will come into play with this as well. For the, the muscle uh, morph, we just push the arms outwards a little bit. So it will be a combination of the vertex displacement and some bone transforms. But these vertex displacement body type morphs are more just for the overall shape of things. You know, it does things that pure bone transforms couldn't do. Because obviously we can still, you know, make individual arms thicker or, you know, make calves thicker, but you don't kind of get that overall shape. Rightio, well, that's the body shape displacement stuff all talked about. Um, I guess the last thing to mention is the actual merging of the meshes. So if we have a look at this uh, character here. <laughs> so this character, um, or this test model, is an old one. Um, so it obviously doesn't line up with the current configuration of, you know, the, the Atlas grid. But you can see that I can just swap out armor pieces on the fly. I've just got, like, some hard-coded items that, you know, we could um, swap between. Basically, the process for equipping items to the character is that we have an array of all of the scally meshes that need to, you know, be applied to the character. So let's just say we've got four items that the player can equip. This is our P for player. These are all their items, and the items are an array of scally meshes. So, for example, uh, one of the items might be the helmet, and the helmet is made up of a helmet and a visor most of the time. Sometimes it has like an arming cap underneath it and stuff like that. This could be the chest plate, which is made up of, you know, the the breastplate and the shirt and the sleeves and the tassets and that kind of thing. And so each of these items, all this information is stored in the object that the player is equipping to themselves. What we would do is get the array of arrays and combine them into one big array. Then we have a plugin that merges the meshes into a new unique scally mesh. And so that all gets combined in here and it turns into the new character model. And then this character model has 
a material, which is our Super Mega Master Mega Material. And these items also have stored in them, you know, some parameters for the material. Now, because we always know what the parameters are called, this one just says, okay, helmet slot one, two, and three, do these colors. Visor slot one, two, and three would be these colors. You know, breastplate slot would be these colors. The shirt colors, the, you know, sleeves colors, the tassets colors, the hood colors, blah, blah, blah. These all just say, okay, update these parameters in the material. And this material is a part of the character model. Uh, and here's our result. It's a tick, a big tick of, you know, we did it. And so that's how we would be, you know, equipping and unequipping items from modular characters. So you can imagine if I'd actually taken time to, you know, export all of the meshes again and set them up into a, you know, mesh merge. You can imagine that this would actually look, you know, nice. Um, unfortunately, I am too lazy to do that, but all of the material swapping and the mesh swapping and stuff will all be completely automated when we have our items and inventory system and equipment system all, you know, ready to go. All in all, it should be incredibly easy and, you know, there's no sort of compromise on how much mileage we can get from each individual asset. So, very stoked. Um, as you saw, you know, at the beginning of the video, it's very performant and yeah, it's just a, it's a system that is built specifically for our game, um, with the requirements that we had and, you know, with a, a small development team in mind, because, you know, every time we create an asset, we want to be able to get as much use out of that asset with as little effort as possible. And they can be randomly or procedurally generated as well. You know, they don't all have to be authored. So there's like infinite customization and therefore infinite character variety within the game. Uh, I guess the only other thing to explain would be what happens this side of the material. Um, but it's kind of a little bit too much to talk about. A lot of it I've already talked about in other videos. So like this bit here is all of the, the fake fabric simulation stuff, which I cover in this video here. All of this stuff here and here and here is stuff that I cover in this video here about the gore system. And that's about it really. Uh, there's, there's a few other things like, you know, reflectiveness, or as I call it, reflection shit. Um, we've got, you know, our dirt and our rust stuff up here that feed in. And we've got, you know, the rim light stuff over here. We've got the, the velvet shader here. Super simple, but looks great. Um, some highlighting stuff here. There's just, you know, a few little bits and bobs. So yeah, I guess that's enough of me rambling. I hope that you maybe learned something today. You know, maybe this has given you a little bit of food for thought about creating characters and that kind of stuff um, and how to sort of lay them out, how to, how to achieve modular characters and reduce draw calls and that kind of thing. So I hope you're looking forward to the next devlog, which may or may not be about the, you know, the fully fleshed out C++ modular combat system and the inventory system and all the weapons and that kind of thing. Uh, which Andrew's been, you know, just smashing out over the past few months. It's very exciting stuff. If you do want to see it all come together live, we do stream on Twitch most days of the week at twitch.tv slash prismaticadev. Uh, it's always a really good time. We love hanging out with all of you guys. Also, if you do want to support this channel and this project, the best way you can do it for the least amount of money is to like and subscribe, like and subscribe, uh, algorithm. But if you do want to go one step further, you can do so for as little as $1 per month at our Patreon, which is always linked below. If you do have any more questions about this system and, you know, any questions about, oh, well, how would you do blah, 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 or how does this work? Or, you know, have you thought about X, Y, Z? Um, please leave a comment in the comment section below because I'd love to hear about, you know, anything else that you might want to know about this system. 
But I guess aside from that, there is nothing more to be said. So with that, I say goodbye. Goodbye.